The first poem is by Pat Pickering. Painting and poem are both called Snow Prints. Walking alone in the cold, the air a cool drink in my throat, I squinting as sunlight reflects on the perfect white snow. I am warm enough in thick grey Icelandic wool and fleece-lined leather. My mind is empty of deep thoughts and my breath is visible before me. The peace and silence is calming as in a meditation. I am floating away. I see the footprints on the pristine ground, a sign of life in the blank canvas. Someone has been here before me and made their mark. It wakes me up and brings me back. I want to leave a sign of my existence. I want to surprise someone walking alone. I lie down on the snowy quilt and my body's imprint makes an angel. I belong in this world. This poem, The Artist's Tale, is by me, Peter Roberts, the title poem of the book. And it's the one poem in the book that doesn't relate to or is inspired by a single painting, but is more a response to the atmosphere and the palette of uh, Silvana's paintings as a whole. And I started to see her work. She probably wouldn't see it like this, but I saw her work as a kind of a quest, a saga, and wrote this poem in uh, that kind of tone. The Artist's Tale. Blackness before time, and at time's beginning, a black gravid with ice blue, its fecundity a harbinger of the blaze of silver white to come. Her black is to light, a silence is to sound, not an absence, but deep imminence, non-being, a heartbeat before the fire of being. And Nurta, the night, gives birth to Mani, the moon. She journeyed to Asgard, realm of the gods, an artist seeking the truth of the world in its unadorned essence, where the earth births new land in fire and ice. And as Hermur returned from hell with Dropnia, the gold ring that could multiply itself, she came back with visions of black, ice blue, silver white, and totems imbued with messages from the gods, sea rack, marked stones, boat timbers, feathers, fish, bones. By her brush these gleamings multiplied like Dropnia, giving back to the world its own poetry reimagined. As if she was Vulva, the seeress, showing Odin, God of Wisdom, healing and death, all that was and all that will be. From blackness, a waxing into ice blue and blazing silver white, waning back to black, the way of all flesh. And Mani, the moon, drowns in Nurta, the night. The Silver Darlings by Carol Godridge. Carol's poem was inspired by a number of prints Silvana made uh, after a stay in the Western Isles. She stands quietly, looking out to sea, hands gently cradled, eyes wet with tears, as she murmurs to herself the ancient prayers. The mesh of her life is woven around the waves, the fish, their food, their livelihood, their world. Her tired hands roar with salt, the wetness and the cutting over the years of toil and the rhythm of daily life. The Silver Darlings gave them all a routine dictated by tides and storms and the everlasting search and then they took away 
for no good reason. The picture is torn apart, as is her heart. She gives thanks for the return of her two strong sons, saved only by the gift of their father's life as he pushed them first from the stricken boat and then rolled with her into the fathomless deep. In her mind she sees his struggle, her heart cries out to him, shares his fear in the cold darkness, the heave and the swell, the slowing of his heart in icy water, the letting go, surrendering to the forces of nature leaving behind echoes of silence, noisy with emptiness, and the cold bed. Her own three silver darlings, now only two, who soon will leave to begin the cycle again, wrapped and trapped in the same netting beside the ocean when she seeks the strength to go on alone. This poem is by David Nielsen. It's called Vigil. The stack, a shadow in the mist, washed by windborne swell, spray greasy on the weed strewn rock to challenge tired and hungry men. The gannets leave to dive for food to feed their googa. When breakers fade and leave no foam, and north winds ease to dry the land, the sea before the stack is calm. Now men may sail and sing their way to meet their father's fading ghosts, and climb the years to wind-torn edge, where roped to rock they too take flight, and join the birds that dance the cliffs, as razor sharp they dive and scream, taunting men through mist and spray, who risk all to feed their own. Midnight in the Bay of Ice was written by myself after I went in summer 2018 with my partner and my son to visit a branch of my family in Newfoundland for the first time. When I saw this beautiful painting, I was really inspired to write this poem. Midnight in the Bay of Ice. The icebergs had already gone, fewer and smaller, disappearing earlier each summer. A boat from Bay Bulls took us out to guillemots and razor bills, clown-like puffins in comic flight, but the hoped for whales never surfaced. At Port Rexton with binoculars, miles out, we saw two humpbacks and a minke from the top of the Skirwink Trail, the unmistakable blows. Seconds later, tail flukes, the curving line of a minke's inky back. I missed the icebergs, those exquisite turquoises and blues my mother had described drifting south through St John's Bay. Our last night, my cousin drove me to the top of Signal Hill at midnight, the whole of St John's ablaze with lights, and beyond, the emptiness of night, land wrapped by the pitch dark of sea. Across the bay, the landmass navy black, a few lights pointing to Cape Spear, Iceberg. This is how I imagined you that night, glittering under a full moon, sending ripples of meltwater across the skin of a placid ocean. We're as far south as Dijon, but everything in this remote land cries north. The glamour of crystal whites, silver grey, ethereal blues preserved in ice. Polar Night by Sue McCormick. 
this painting, uh, Fold, uh, reminded uh, Sue of uh, a, a journey she'd made with her partner uh, by ship along the north coast of Norway. Uh, and this is captured in the poem. This is how it is when the sun barely rises, shares the silver sky with the moon, blurred circles above white mountains and grey sea. The world is mother of pearl, the earth ancient, the water like glass. This is how it feels when the land on either side towers over the channel of the sea, soft-edged walls of cloudy rock becoming sky, becoming water. The world is a colourless mystery, the earth unearthly, the water fathomless, and the air as still as a held breath. So titles weren't important to Silvana and she often added them, if she added them at all, as an afterthought to the work. And this is one of the few images we had where the title was known before Jane wrote the poem. Having now been to Shetland, I think Jane captures the Shetlandic atmosphere beautifully. And I was surprised to learn after she'd written this poem that she's never in fact been there herself. I have to leave the island and feel the snow on the wind. A last walk on the moonstone sands, the sea, emerald, navy and aquamarine, makes frothy ripples round my feet. I stare into the mysterious ocean and see banks of kelp, a garden of seaweed, brown boulder locks moving on the tide and stringy thogweed winding thongs around my toes. I scoop seaweed into my hand, salty and wild, while snowflake flakes brush past my face. I say, farewell Shetland, once home, I will remember you in paint. Disappearing Ravens by Muriel Young. Muriel was fascinated by this print and didn't know how to begin to write about it. In the end, she propped it on her desk and simply looked at it for a week. And this poem is the result of that intense focus. Not images from Viking lands, neither Prussian blue nor black. No silver threads or trails of icy light or alien shapes or beads of glistening water. No egg, shining stone on trellis laid. No threatening glacier. Appearing as in a dream, two birds from cave wall, together since time began. The pair stand serenely, she warily regarding his more solid form acknowledging his strength, so casually worn. He regards her possessively, his queen of many years, wooed when she was a fledgling with his dramatic acrobatics, skills honed when delivering supper to broods too frail to know the enemy. Her tentative glance belies patience beyond bounds, never departing a clutch protecting frail bodies with orange caves, nurtured even in winds which took her sails aloft. She has no need to question his constancy. Mutual efforts assure the future. But they disappear into mist, ravens bleaching into light. This is uh, my poem, Valfjall, Whale Mountain. Uh, Annie mentioned earlier that uh, Silvana uh, get, often thought about titles for her paintings long after they'd been painted. And this is a poem that I wrote without knowing the title 
of the uh, painting. Uh, it is actually called Green Fjord Waters, but I'm glad I didn't know that because I might not have written uh, this poem because what I saw in the painting is a mountain that looks like a sleeping whale. And there is actually in Iceland a whale mountain and at its foot is Valfjorda, the last commercial whaling station in, uh, in Iceland. Valfjall, whale mountain. Long ago before the age of men, a blue whale full of prescient rage at the coming slaughter of her kin rose from shoreless seas through a maelstrom of fire and steam to be a mountain sentinel at the ocean's edge. In this land of fire and groaning ice, nothing is quite what it seems. The whale mountain watched and listened and waited for what was foretold in the whale prophecies. When the men in longboats drove the first pilot whales ashore in dark Valfjorda, she sang to them songs of sorrow and comfort. Then the big ships with fearsome weapons brought the dead, Finn, Wright, Say and Humpback, her blue kin, to the butchering place at her foot. Only the minky whales were spared because man believed they were protectors sent by their god. In this land of fire and cracking ice, the blood of whales is man's currency. And she listened to the men below, chests puffed, telling their bloody tales of battle with the monsters of the deep, telling them to the mountain, to her, as if she was no more than an altar to their dominion of the oceans. In this land of fire and breaking ice, she knew her vengeance would come. For in this tenuous, half-forged place, the land is held by delicate stitching that one day will break, whale mountains slide back into the ocean, and the tsunami sweep away the murderous men of Valfjorda. In this land of fire and melting ice, only their fading stories will remain, as whales circle the drowned earth, singing. Phases of Grief by Annie Wright. I was inspired to write this, thinking uh, a lot about Silvana and her work, and it's the last poem I wrote uh, and found this particular image very moving. Her remains have migrated to this land where wolf stands guard over bones an arctic hare performs his tricks under speckled moons. The tides receded tossed up razor clam and mussel shells on freshly laundered sand. Seaweeds left her ink scribble. A boot print fades, leavings dimming into grey. Lunar months pull us through the relentless void of night, a silver edge on bleakness. Every day washes away yesterday's silt and clutter. She saw how a patch of ochre gleams with a hint of green, how drabs of dull blues might drag the grieving through the dark to lift a feather, heft a particular stone, and with the waxing and the waning moon, move inexorably on.